Nina Marini, hi. Welcome to the South Australian Museum. We're on Ghana land, traditional land of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. It's National Science Week, and the theme is Deep Blue, Innovations for the Future of Our Oceans. I'm Leanne Wheaton. I'm the Education Manager here at the South Australian Museum. I'm here with Elaine Vidapil. She's a marine biologist. And together, we're going to look at some of the amazing biodiversity in South Australia. Thanks, Leanne. It's great to be here. And today, we're going to do a tour of the Biodiversity Gallery, looking at some of the amazing creatures we have here in South Australia's marine environment. We're going to meet some of the scientists who are going to take us behind the scenes and look at the collections that we have here um, that the public generally don't get to see. We're going to tell you a lot more about the amazing ecosystems and species living here in South Australia in our marine environment. We're going to talk about some of the innovations being developed by scientists to develop a sustainable future for our oceans. And we're also going to talk about things that each and every one of us can do to look after our oceans and therefore look after our planet. So let's go take a look. Hello, I'm Dr Andrea Crowther and I'm a Senior Collection Manager for Marine Invertebrates Collection here at the Museum. Our Biological Sciences collections have a wide range of animals from tiniest parasites to the largest of whales and dolphins, which you can see behind me. Over three million specimens of animals have been collected over the last 150 years. The collections focus on South Australian fauna, so they are our library of life. The collections allow us to see how species have been distributed over time, so they're really important for historical context. The role of museums in recording our species distribution is really important now that we are losing species. So let's have a look at some of the marine biodiversity here in SA by going to our biodiversity gallery. We're in the biodiversity gallery, and the great thing about this gallery is it lets you take a thousand kilometre walk from the hot dry deserts of the north to the deep oceans of the south in about 50 metres. We've taken a transect which is a line through the map that moves you through these different habitats and lets you see what lives there. So instead of going for an exhausting four week hike, you can move through this space in about half an hour. The museum has done all the hard work for you. So now we're going to look at a bunch of the marine environments here in South Australia. We're going to start here at the coast and make our way out towards the open ocean. And each of these displays have been designed very specifically in great detail to show you the kinds of plants and animals that all live together and have evolved over millions of years to interact with each other and with the physical environment in which they live. And that is what an ecosystem is. So it's a very complex and multi-layered uh, dynamic system where all plants, animals and the physical environment interact to form a very balanced and supportive ecosystem. So here we are on a sandy beach and where we see big obvious life. But there's also microscopic life that lives in the sediments of the sand and we call that the infauna. There are animals such as little worms or crabs, different types of bivalves, which are types of mollusks, and things like diatoms as well. There's also evidence of other life too that we can find on the beach. So on this beach here we can see cuttle bones, which are from cuttlefish, sea urchin tests, which are from sea urchins, and even shark eggs, where the baby shark is no longer part of that shark egg. We're now moving to the sheltered Gulf ecosystems of the Gulf of St. Vincent and Spencer Gulf. And these are really unique habitats and ecosystems in South Australia. And it's a really great place to live if you're a little fish or a little crustacean because there's lots of places to hide. They're also really important habitats for recycling nutrients, for absorbing a lot of the carbon in our atmosphere and in our oceans because there's so much photosynthesis being carried out in these forests. So it's really important important for reducing erosion of our shores here in South Australia. Here we are at a rocky reef now and it's a very diverse and interconnected ecosystem. And we actually have a really special rocky reef here in South Australia, up in northern Spencer Gulf at Point Lowly. Every year we get a mass migration of the South Australian 
giant cuttlefish. And tens of thousands of animals come together every year for this mass breeding event. And they lay their eggs underneath rocky ledges on the rocky reef. And there's nowhere else in the world that we know of where this type of breeding aggregation occurs for this species. The final part of our journey across South Australia's marine environments, we arrive at the open ocean. And this is a vast and deep space. And in the deep ocean, we know that light can penetrate down to about 200 metres. And in that surface layer of the ocean, there is a lot of life and a lot of fish and whales and animals that we can see. But if we go deeper, it gets darker and darker. When we reach the bottom of the ocean floor where it's pitch black, there's still an amazing array of life living down there. Very distinct ecosystems, an amazing diversity of plants and animals and many of which we're still only just discovering. There's so much research still to be done in discovering our marine biodiversity. So we've finished our thousand kilometre journey across South Australia, but we've travelled on a little further from the main building of the South Australian Museum on North Terrace, and we've arrived at the Science Centre. And this is a part of the museum that very few people know about, and very few people actually get to see. We're here in the Marine Invertebrates Collection. The Marine Invertebrates Collection is managed by myself and my colleague, Shirley Sorokin. We look after about 23 phyla of animals, and that includes examples like crabs, jellyfish, corals, mollusks, all different kinds that we'll show you a bit later. When a specimen comes into our collection, we make sure we give it an official registration number, we digitise the data into our database, and then we file the specimen away in our collection. We saw our collection taxonomically, which means species that are most closely related, you'll find them closer on the shelves. Here we have a very special specimen that's in our collection. It's a chitin, which is a type of mollusk collected from Tasmania in 1802 by French explorers. We think it's the earliest collected natural history specimen in our museum. Many marine invertebrates are very colourful and beautiful in real life. Once we collect them, we need to preserve them, usually in 70% ethanol. During this process, their colour is often lost, along with patterns that they may have had when they were alive. To keep information like that, we also take photos when they were alive and we keep those digital images and link them to the specimens. A really important South Australian species is a giant Australian cuttlefish, or the scientific name Sepia apama. You might not always see them like this. What you may see is evidence of them from the beach. This is a cuttle bone, which is actually dissected out of a giant Australian cuttlefish. And we keep these in our dry collection here at the Marine Invertebrates. So thank you for joining us and we hope you have a better understanding now of some of the complexity of biodiversity in our southern Australian marine environment. Hi, I'm Elaine, a marine biologist, and I'm at the South Australian Museum for National Science Week. We've been taking a look at the marine displays and behind the scenes in the Science Centre. Check out our video if you haven't already. We've put together some information to share with you now about the unique coastal and marine ecosystems of South Australia. The plants and animals all depend on each other for survival. They have adapted to feed, breed, and live in specific ways and places in the environment. Everything is connected and in balance, except when changes occur, often due to human activity. We will talk about some of the problems, some interesting solutions and ways we can all care for our natural environments, including the oceans, through our choices and actions every day. 
But first, a question. Why do you think oceans are important? Maybe you've thought about this already. Here are some things to consider. So our oceans are big. They cover most of our planet. 71% of the Earth's surface is ocean and 99% of the living space is contained in the ocean. So as a result, they support much of our planet's biodiversity. They're also really important because of the relationship they have with the atmosphere. So they regulate the carbon dioxide and oxygen levels. And because of the currents, they influence weather patterns and climate around the world. Now we've thought a little bit about the importance of oceans on our planet. Let's focus in on our ocean in South Australia and the Southern Ocean. Due to our geography, weather patterns and ocean currents, we have some really interesting and unique ecosystems. Okay, so let's have a look at what actually does live here in our marine environment. So let's do uh, a bit of a transect like we did um, when we walked through the biodiversity gallery. Uh, we will start at sandy beaches, move across rocky shores, we might visit some mangroves and seagrass forests up in the estuary, go out to rocky reefs and then look in the open water, the pelagic environment. So this is probably the marine habitat most of us are most familiar with, sandy beaches. And at first glance, it doesn't always appear like there's lots living there, but if you take a closer look, you will find signs of life. And often we'll see things washed up on the beach that um, give us a hint of what is living out there in the open ocean. So we'll find always lots of cockle shells, especially if you head down to Goolwa Beach or Middleton. Um, a lot of them are empty, but if you dig down a little bit, you might find some live cockle shells like this one, where you can see the mollusk, the bivalve, actually has its muscular foot popping out of the shell. And that's what he uses, or he or she, uses to dig down into the sand and to feed on some of the microorganisms and the bacteria, the little particles of food living in the sand. Uh, you might find cuttlefish shells washed up on the beach. And these, of course, belong to the giant cuttlefish, Sepia apama. And they live all along our southern coastline, right from WA over to Victoria but we do have a very unique population of them living up in the Spencer Gulf. And we'll talk a bit more about them later on. You might find things like sponges washed up on the beach. And these are animals that live out on rocky reefs and can get washed up on shore. Seagrass bowls and seagrass. And the bowls are just little fibers of seagrass that have been rolled around by the waves and form these great little bowls that are fun to have sea bowl fights with if you uh, want to have a bit of a game on the beach. Uh, we can find lots of seaweed, algae, like this brown algae washed up on the beach. And some interesting other creatures like over here at the top we have, um, this is a Port Jackson egg shark. So some of the smaller sharks actually don't give birth to life um, babies, they actually lay eggs. So the um, baby shark is in that egg and will develop and eventually hatch out of the egg when it's, when it's ready to fend for itself. We might find little fish washed up like this porcupine fish. Uh, these guys, which a lot of people actually think are jellyfish, but in fact, they're egg sacs from a moon snail. So if you take a close look at these, you'll see lots of little dots in that gelatinous sac, which are actually the eggs of a of, of snail might find stingrays washed up on the beach, jellyfish, little crabs. Sometimes we'll see these walking along the beach, um, which aren't actually animals, but they're evidence that animals are living just below the surface. So these are formed by polychaete worms that burrow into the sand. And as they go, they ingest the sand and any food particles in the sand. Um, and they, uh, out the other end, they uh, release these mucus uh, sandy coils of sand. So if you see these on the beach you, and you start digging, you'll probably find yourself a worm. And of course, we'll find seabirds on the beach, like gulls and terns. So let's move over to rocky shores now. And rocky shores are pretty wild habitats to, to live at if you're a little creature. So lots of big waves, um, 
it can be a bit dangerous because uh, there's lots of things that can come and try and eat you. Uh, sometimes you're underwater when the tide's up and sometimes you're exposed when the tide's out and you're at risk of drying out. There's lots of competition for space and food. So a lot of the animals living on rocky shores, intertidal rocky shores, become very specialised to live in these environments. Some of them are bigger animals that are quite obvious, more so when you go um, to more remote rocky shores or off onto the islands like West Island or Granite Island. So um, we might see marine birds um, like gulls and fairy penguins, um, and we might see some of the pinnipeds, which is just a scientific name for um, the seals and the, fur, the sea lions and the fur seals um, that we get here in South Australia. If you look closely in some of the rock pools, you'll start to see some smaller animals that inhabit these rocky shores. So you'll start to see things like, um, these are chitons, so that's a mollusk, and he's got his muscular foot firmly holding him to the rock so he doesn't get washed away. He's got these lovely shells over his back to stop him getting eaten by anything, very protective armor. Uh, we see things like starfish, uh, sea urchins, sea anemones, lots of little um, gastropods like naritas, periwinkles, limpets, um, and they're grazing on, quite often grazing on some of the lichen growing over the rocks. And we might see crustaceans as well, so like little crabs and little shrimps, and these barnacles, which um, have, uh, are very well adapted for living on a rocky shore, so they cement themselves to the rock and have these protective um, shells around them so they don't get, so they don't dry out and they don't get eaten by anything. So the Spencer Gulf and the Gulf of St. Vincent are the two largest temperate inverse estuaries in Australia. And what I mean by an inverse estuary is that they have more salt water, so there's more salinity at the head of the estuary than at the mouth. And this is because we have very low rainfall here in South Australia. So we don't get uh, the, the top of the gulf doesn't get washed out by fresh water. Um, and similarly, there's not a lot of water coming in from the mouth of the estuary. The, not a lot of nutrients gets into the water because of the low rainfall from land. Um, and so they're very low nutrient, highly saline environments, but they do support ecosystems that are highly productive. And they're closed systems, so they recycle the nutrients within these systems. There is also a lot of temperature fluctuation in these estuaries because they are quite shallow water and they're not getting flushed out a lot. So in summer, they tend to heat up a lot with the weather and in winter, they'll cool down a lot. So high variations in temperature um, and very low in nutrients and quite high in salinity. So quite unique habitats that we have here in South Australia. And there are um, plants and animals. There are ecosystems that have evolved to live in these very specialized habitats. So the first one I'm going to talk about are mangroves. And mangrove trees grow in the gulfs and are especially adapted to survive these muddy tidal areas. So they're regularly inundated with seawater, live with their roots in the seawater, and they've adapted by evolving these specialized roots that stick up from the waterlogged mud like snorkels. And they're called pneumatophores, and they help the tree to get enough oxygen through their roots as they grow. And many species of mangroves have evolved to filter the salt out as it enters their roots, and others have evolved to excrete salt through glands in their leaves. And these mangroves provide a really important habitat for lots of animals living in and amongst their roots. So the leaf litter, so the mangrove trees, and the leaves of the mangroves um, get eaten by the animals that live in the mangroves and they're in turn eaten by other animals that, that may die in the forest and decompose and return the nutrients back to the forest and the other animals to feed on them. So it's a whole ecosystem of plants and animals, um, a very closed system and they all support one another. And we might get lots of little animals uh, living in the habitat and um, some of them spend their whole lives living in the mangroves 
and some of them actually just spend the juvenile stage of their life cycle living in the mangroves. So some of these smaller invertebrate species will spend their whole life in the mangroves. Um, so we might find uh, little juvenile prawns, um, small crabs, barnacles, amphipods, um, isopods, uh, tineids, uh, polychaete worms, some snails here, some gastropods, um, little crabs. And then we get some of the larger animals. And a lot of these larger animals spend their juvenile stage in the mangrove. So it's like a, a nursery area for the smaller animals. It's a great place to live if you don't, if you're a little fish or a little crab and you don't want to get eaten, you can hide in amongst the roots. And then when you're big enough, you can move out of the mangroves into sea grass beds or out onto rocky reefs or out into the open ocean. And a lot of uh, very important commercial fishery species um, actually um, live in the mangroves as juveniles. So things like whiting, mullet, garfish, herring and salmon. And then of course we'll get some of the bigger animals like the um, dolphins coming in to feed on all the life that is living within the mangrove system. And also attracted to these ecosystems are seabirds that come in to take advantage of all the little creatures living in amongst the mangroves. So the next habitat we're going to um, talk about are seagrass beds. Um, and we see them growing in our estuaries here in South Australia. And they dominate much of these gulfs, and all, but they also occur along the sheltered nearshore habitats of our coastline. And seagrasses are actually flowering plants. So they've evolved from land plants and adapted to live in the marine environment. And here in South Australia, we actually have the largest areas of temperate, so cold water, seagrass forests in the world. So a lot of seagrasses occur in the warmer tropical regions of the world, but here in South Australia, we do have the largest um, cold water forests. And we have a total of 11 different species of seagrasses growing here in South Australia. And we're going to, we see lots of different animals, um, like the mangroves, they're a really important habitat for a very, very rich biodiversity of marine organisms. So they play a really vital role in the marine food web of South Australia. So we find some species that spend their entire life cycle within the habitat, um, like these cuttlefish, or they, they also could move to other habitats. Um, but a lot of the smaller invertebrates, like the mollusks and the crustaceans, um, will spend their entire life cycle in the, in the seagrass beds, living on the fronds of, of grass. Um, and then we see a lot of um, juvenile species that then move out further out into rocky reefs in the open ocean. So again, like the mangroves, the seagrasses act as a breeding and a nursery habitat for a lot of the juvenile species of, of marine life that then move out into the open ocean. And again, lots of really important commercial fishery species like the whiting, the tailor, um, blue swimmer crabs, western king prawn, southern calamari. So lots of really important fishery species that rely on mangroves and seagrass beds um, to grow up to be, um, to, before they become adults and move further out. Also likely to see um, some of our iconic South Australian sea dragons, like the leafy sea dragon and the weedy sea dragon, living in amongst the seagrass where they're, where they're very well camouflaged and protected. Seagrasses um, don't only support a lot of biodiversity, but they're really important for um, a few other things like nutrient cycling, a bit like the mangroves. So even um, in a decomposing state, so as the blades of grass are breaking down, it's still a really important and main source of food for a lot of animals. Uh, they also store a lot of carbon. So they store as much as twice as much carbon as terrestrial forests on land. And so they play a really important role in reducing global greenhouse gas emissions. They're also really important for oxygenating the water because they have such a rapid rate of photosynthesis. They keep the water clean by filtering out suspended solids in the water column. And they're really important for reducing coastal erosion, erosion by stabilizing the sediment. So they hold onto the sand with their roots and reduce the waves and currents near the seabed with their leaves. And it's been estimated that seagrass beds trap at least a meter of sand beneath them. So seagrass beds are important for maintaining biodiversity, water quality, 
looking after our atmosphere and maintaining the structural stability of our coasts. So they're a really important habitat. And in South Australia, seagrass beds are now protected under the Native Vegetation Act. And that's because we've lost so many of them in recent years. So over the past 50 years, we've lost about a third of the seagrasses growing along our metropolitan coast. And you can see here in this slide, um, this dark area here back in 1972 is a rich, lush uh, meadow of seagrass. Seven years later, completely disappeared slowly, 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 slowly growing back. This is now 2018. So what happened? Why did they all disappear? Well, seagrass forests have evolved to live in low nutrient waters, and they've been experiencing stress as our city has grown because of poor water quality. So the water that's draining into our oceans has been polluted, uh, might have been high in nutrients from fertilizers, um, stormwater runoff, sewage, um, effluent disposal. Um, and so this um, poor water quality actually caused us to lose most of our seagrass beds. So the South Australian government is now undertaking a large seagrass restoration project to try and re-establish seagrass um, off the metropolitan coast. The next habitat we're going to talk about are rocky reefs. And most of them occur offshore, um, out towards the, towards the open water off our rocky coastline. Um, but before we talk about those, I'm going to talk about a very special one that lives up in the top of the Spencer Gulf around Point, Point Lowly. And this is where um, this very special population of the giant cuttlefish live that we were talking about earlier. So each winter, tens of thousands of Australian giant cuttlefish aggregate on this very discrete area in, the, in northern Spencer Gulf to spawn and breed. Um, and they have these amazing and colourful displays. Um, they have very uh, um, elaborate um, behaviours and they um, successfully breed and the females lay teardrop shaped eggs underneath rocky ledges. And you can see these tiny little baby cuttlefish growing inside the egg and they hatch about three to five months later. Um, and recently scientists have determined that this population of giant cuttlefish do remain in Spencer Gulf um, and they aggregate um, up on this rocky reef over the winter months to spawn and breed. It's a very unique phenomenon and a very um, incredible biological spectacle. So um, I don't know if any, anyone's ever been out to have a look at these um, cuttlefish breeding aggregations, but um, you can just drive over to Point Lowly and put on a snorkel and a mask and go have a look for yourself. It's, it's quite a beautiful and amazing biological phenomenon to see. So most of our rocky reefs along our southern coastline occur off the coast. They actually cover about 30% of our coastline from WA right over to Victoria. And they support a huge diversity of life, of life. And it's only been since about the 1960s when scuba was invented, invented that we really started to understand what's living on these rocky reefs. And they're predominantly covered by algae or, and, or kelp forests. And these forests provide a really important habitat for a huge diversity and, and abundance of other marine life. So they're like the rainforests of our cold oceans. Um, so if you ever go diving over a reef and start sticking your head in amongst the kelp, you'll see a lot of other animals living there. So you'll see invertebrate animals like this beautiful yellow sponge. So lots of invertebrates that attach themselves to the reef and um, are suspension feeders. So they'll take advantage of the high currents or, and tidal movement that delivers lots of food over the reef that they can filter out and feed on. Um, you might see lots of um, and uh, bryzoans, uh, which are little colonial organisms, ascidians, which are, which are sea squirts, little hydroids, so echinoderms, which are the starfish, mollusks, snails, um, and crustaceans, like little crabs and shrimps, etc. So um, it's a great place to live if you're a little animal, because you can hide in amongst the seaweed and in the rock crevices, uh, so you don't you have less chance of getting eaten. Um, 
And some of the life on these reefs is not very obvious at all because it's so tiny and it's living in these in lots of little microhabitats. Like this here is the base of a kelp. It's called the holdfast. So it's what, what the seaweed uses to hold on to the rock um, beneath it. And just in that little microhabitat alone, you would literally find thousands of little invertebrate animals, like little worms, little mollusks, uh, little crustaceans living in that little microhabitat alone. So there's a huge riches, richness of life living um, on reefs. And we'll also find some of the larger fish and things like octopus and cuttlefish that use the rocky reef as a cover from which they can ambush passing prey because there's lots to eat on a reef. And a lot of pelagic or open water fish are also attracted to rocky reefs by aggregations of small bait fish that they can feed on. So like the mangroves and the seagrasses, um, they support a lot of the important fishery species. Um, uh, like fish and invertebrates that depend on rocky reefs um, for some or all of their life cycle, like rock lobster and abalone. And here in southern Australia, our rocky reefs actually support the world's highest diversity of red and brown algae, over uh, 1,100 species. Um, you can see here some brown algae, some uh, red algae, and this which is a crustose coralline red algae. So it's a hard, it's got calcium carbonate in it, um, and it, it's a really key microhabitat, another, again another microhabitat for the larvae of some really economically important invertebrates such as uh, the abalone. Um, so baby abalone can live in amongst the, the red algae. We also have the world's highest diversity of sea squirts, uh, ascidians, like these little purple ones here, bryozoans, which are the little colonial animals, so little lace corals they're called, um, and a lot of crustaceans as well. Unfortunately, we're seeing the loss of a lot of kelp forests around the world, um, including in Europe and North America, and down the east and west coast of Australia. Um, and in particular, the Eastern Australian current is getting warmer and stronger, and it's actually um, causing the die off of kelp forests along our east coast. And in fact, the east coast of Tasmania is almost completely void of any kelp forest. It used to be um, one large kelp forest pretty much along that coastline. They're now pretty much gone. And with the warm water, um, we're also seeing the introduction of these uh, urchins that um, enjoy the warmer water and love to feed on kelp. So they're coming in and grazing on the kelp forests and eliminating entire kelp forests. And of course, we don't just lose the kelp, we lose the entire ecosystem. So all the tiny little plants and animals and the big plants and animals that rely on kelp forests for life, they've all disappeared as a result of this warming water and the urchin invasions. We're now moving out into the pelagic or the open ocean. And this is a vast space. So animals have evolved to be large and to be fast and they can dive deep and migrate vast distances. And as we said earlier, the open water oceans are usually very low in nutrients. So any organic material that's produced in the zone, like fish poo or dead animals, actually sink to the depths of the ocean and are lost to the upper zone. Now, apart from these two areas of nutrient upwelling, here um, in southern Australia. So we tend to get these seasonal upwellings of the cold nutrient rich water and as a result we get these plankton blooms that we talked about earlier. So millions and millions of tiny little plants and animals growing in the water as a result of the nutrients um, and the sunlight um, and they're so tiny that you could fit a thousand onto the uh, head of a pin. And these are really important um, because they form the base of the marine food chain. So these upwellings kickstart an ecosystem and that moves right up the food chain. So the phytoplankton are eaten by the zooplankton, so the tiny plants are eaten by the tiny animals, which are eaten by the jellyfish, 
which are eaten by juvenile fish, which move right up the food chain. And even um, these upwellings are used by migratory, large migratory species like the southern right whale, pygmy blue whales that feed on the krill, so the tiny little um, crustaceans, shrimp crustaceans living in the water column. Um, and the plankton also plays a really important role in the life cycle of juvenile southern bluefin tuna, which accumulate in the eastern Great Australian Bight during the upwelling season and feed on sardines and anchovies that thrive as a result of this oasis of life. Um, and they also feed um, some of the larger uh, pelagic species like sharks, fur seals, sea lions and birds, and many dead organisms that fall to the bottom of the continental shelf support populations of things like the southern rock lobster and the giant crab. We have a better understanding now of the biodiversity that lives in our southern oceans. So why is all this biodiversity important? Biodiversity is important because it supports ecosystem health. So in this example, we can see a food chain that exists in an ecosystem. So where we lose some of the biodiversity from this ecosystem, it can have a cascading effect on all the other plants and animals living within the ecosystem. So if, for example, we were to remove uh, the apex predators like the large sharks, we might see a population bloom of some of their prey species like the tuna. And if we suddenly get very large population numbers of tuna, they might over predate on some of the smaller fish species and inadvertently run out of food because they overeat this smaller fish population. So you can see that the removal of one aspect of the ecosystem can have a cascading effect along the food chain. Similarly, if we were to lose some of the really tiny plankton species from the food chain, and they need nutrients and sunlight to grow. So if they suddenly didn't have enough nutrients and were to die off, the, the basis of the food chain, the food that provides the production and energy that moves up the food chain to support all other life in that ecosystem could collapse. And in a similar way, many of the ecosystems we find in the marine environment are connected and support one another. So if, for example, we were to lose the mangroves and the seagrass beds, we would lose a really, some really important habitats that many species rely, rely upon for part of their life history. So if we were to lose the mangroves and seagrass, we lose a very important breeding and nursery habitat for a lot of the fish and invertebrates that move further out onto rocky reefs and the open water when they grow into adults. So biodiversity matters because it supports ecosystems, but it also matters for a few other reasons. One is that there's enjoyment to be had. I don't know about you, but I love the ocean and I love being in the ocean and I love experiencing all the life that's in the ocean. And there's a lot of ecotourism. So there's an economy that um, is based on a healthy ocean environment. Biodiversity also matters because it supports a very large seafood industry. So approximately 3 billion people in the world rely on, on wild caught or farmed seafood as a primary source of protein. And we know that 85% of marine fish stocks are already either fully exploited or overfished. And if we lose fisheries, not only do we lose a source of food for billions of people around the world, but a lot of people um, whose, whose livelihoods depend on healthy fish stocks um, will lose their jobs and lose their incomes. Biodiversity also matters because it affects our ocean chemistry and therefore our atmosphere. So as you recall, uh, our oceans are really important for absorbing um, carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. So we know our oceans are important for many reasons, including supporting biodiversity, supporting our atmosphere, and supporting our climate. So how are we impacting our ocean biodiversity? One way we're hurting our oceans and the biodiversity they contain is through overfishing. And when we pull too many fish out of our oceans and the biodiversity drops, 
this can lead to ecosystem collapse. And we know that globally, already 85% of marine fish stocks are overfished and on the verge of collapse. We're also hurting our marine biodiversity with the introduction of pest species. So these are species of plants and animals that have been introduced from other parts of the world. And they travel to different parts of the ocean through large boats. So a lot of the large boats have ballast water in their hull that they release when they get to port. And if there's any animals or plants living in that water, they can then settle and move into our ocean waters. They can also attach to the outside of the hulls of boats. And these pest species, like in South Australia, we've got the European fanworm, can start to outcompete the native species that, we're living here, that are living here. So they might compete for food and living space and can be actually uh, quite detrimental to ecosystem health. Another way we're hurting our oceans and our biodiversity is through pollution. So things like plastic, fertilizers, sewerage, oil spills, all the things from land that end up in the ocean and that hurt our biodiversity. We know that each year about 8 million tons of plastic enter our ocean. So that's about one and a half million elephants worth of plastic going into our oceans every year. And plastic can be mistaken as food for a lot of marine creatures like sea turtles and seabirds that end up dying as a result of ingesting the plastic. And a lot of these plastics can break down into microplastics that can poison the biodiversity that feeds on them. And finally, we're really hurting our biodiversity in our oceans through climate change. So as our atmosphere warms, our oceans absorb 90% of that heat. So our oceans are getting warmer. And this is detrimental to a lot of plants and animals that have evolved to live in cooler water systems. Also, the increasing carbon dioxide being absorbed by our oceans causes them to become more acidic. And again, this can hurt a lot of the biodiversity in our oceans. The good news is that there are a lot of scientists and engineers working hard to develop a sustainable way forward for our oceans. We have 7.8 billion people on this planet and they all need food and they all need energy and our oceans might just be the solution. The Australian government has developed a new research centre called the Blue Economy and it will, for the first time, bring the aquaculture, the renewable energy and the engineering sectors together to address the challenges of offshore food and energy production. We are a large island and we have a lot of ocean that we can use to solve our food and energy problems. The Blue Economy Research Centre will design ways to produce renewable energy from things like sunlight, waves and tides, and wind out at sea. Electricity will be used to run fish farms in the deep ocean and also send some of the surplus energy back to land to run our cities. At the moment we don't have much fish farming on our coast because it's hard to find the right conditions to run the farms and they can pollute the water and cause damage to coastal habitats. So the blue economy will solve this problem by, desi by designing offshore technology to generate clean energy and produce seafood without hurting the environment. Kelp farming is another strategy for solving many of the problems our oceans and our planet faces. Already kelp, kelp is farmed in many areas around the world in shallow coastal waters for food and fertilizers. Scientists and engineers are now designing ways to grow it in the open ocean. That way you can grow huge areas of kelp to help absorb the carbon dioxide in the water and grow a lot of food. Kelp is incredibly fast growing. It can grow up to 60 centimetres a day and can reach lengths of 60 metres. So vast areas of kelp could be grown quickly, providing food and habitat for thousands of other marine creatures. Growing kelp farms will help fish stocks recover from being overfished. In the open ocean, kelp would be grown on floating pla platforms just below the surface of the ocean, like you can see in this diagram here. But for kelp to grow, you also need nutrients. So to get the nutrients up, engineers are devising a pump system that uses tides and waves to pump the nutrient-rich water from the ocean floor to the surface. 
So with sunlight and nutrient, this will allow the kelp to grow really fast. It will also help plankton to grow in our oceans, and that can provide another food source for fish and other aquatic species like scallops and clams that we might want to use in aquaculture. Kelp can be used by us humans as a food source or a fertilizer, and it can even be dropped to the bottom of the ocean to store carbon dioxide. And all this seaweed and plankton growing in our oceans will help absorb all that extra carbon dioxide that is heating up our ocean and making it acidic. What was once an aquatic desert will begin to thrive with life. There are lots more interesting projects to be done all over the world that you could research. But what things can you and all of us do every day to help look after our oceans? We need to remember that just because we live on land doesn't mean we can't make a big difference to our oceans. So let's have a look now at what we can all do. The first thing is reduce. So everything we do in our lives uses so much energy and most of that energy comes from fossil fuels. So if we can, can cut down on our energy usage, we can make a huge difference. So turning off appliances, turning off lights. If we can ride or walk places more than we drive, drying our clothes out in the fresh air rather than an electric clothes dryer, using a broom instead of a vacuum cleaner, taking shorter showers because it takes lots of energy to heat water, growing our own food, and wearing our clothes for a long time rather than just throwing them away because we want to wear something that's more fashionable. Did you know that every 10 minutes in Australia, six tons of clothing goes into landfill? And that's what that picture is showing you there. So every 10 minutes, that much clothing gets thrown away and ends up breaking down in landfill to form methane gas, which is even more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And where we can't reduce, we can certainly reuse. So no single use plastics like plastic straws. We can use reusable straws, reusable drink bottles and coffee cups. We don't need to use plastic to store our food. We can use lunch boxes and glass containers and old spaghetti and jam jars. And we can use reusable bags. And then where we can't reduce or reuse, we can certainly recycle. And we all now have lots of options with recycling. So yellow bins for recycling, green bins for organics, and then a general waste. We can take our 10 cent bottles to the depot and make a bit of money. We can take our soft plastics to Coles and Woolworths to be recycled. We can, re we can throw our green waste either into a garden compost bin or into a little council bin that you can then put into your big green bin. We can recycle light globes at hardware stores and batteries can go to your li local library or to an Aldi store. And mobile phones can be recycled as well. So there's lots of things we can recycle. So very, very little should actually be going into your landfill bin. It's also important to communicate. So tell your family and friends what you know and what they can do to help. Put pressure on companies. Let them know what matters to you and talk to government. So you could send a letter straight to the top, send a letter to Scott Morrison, or you could send one to your local member, your state member or federal member and tell them what's important to you. We only have one planet. There's no planet B. So let's look after it.